What's going on this morning, Inglewood? We doing good? I'm excited to be here. It's uh, Super Bowl Sunday, as a lot of you know. This morning, uh, we're going to talk about something that is critical uh, to the church. Um, it's critical to our understanding of what the body of Christ actually is. Um, but being Super Bowl Sunday, I just wanted to um, just talk a little bit about you know, what's going to happen tonight and then you know, how it relates to what we're doing here on a Sunday morning. Uh, because there's a lot of us that are going to watch a game tonight where, where there are people, athletes, that spend tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to have the right body to play the game. Uh, and I, I don't know about you, but I can't even fathom spending that amount of money uh, just to have a, a, certain, uh, a certain way to look. But they do it because it's necessary, because they, that there's a certain ability that they have to have. And what they're going to do is they're going to fight tonight for a specific trophy. Now, as I said, I know that a lot of us are disappointed um, because neither the Chiefs nor the Steelers uh, made it to the Super Bowl. I know there's some other teams represented here, but we could be here all morning uh, going, through the, going through the list. But the, the Steelers actually beat the Chiefs uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I know some of you are sad. Uh, some of you are a little bit uh, as a, a sore subject. But what's interesting is I'm still trying to figure this out. They beat the Chiefs without even scoring a touchdown. Um, it, that, I don't really know how that happened. Um, but then the Steelers were beat by the Patriots, probably the most hated team uh, in the NFL. There are some people that love them. There, there are some. Uh, they probably all live in the Northeast somewhere. Uh, but... <laughs> Every football team has fans. Every football team, uh, whether you hate them, somebody in, somewhere in the world loves them. And every single team has players, star players. Uh, you can probably think of some of the teams, and, and just naming the team names, you can probably come up with some of the star players. Let, let's try just a little bit this morning. The Chiefs, help me out here. What are some players that come to mind? Okay, what about the Steelers? I know there's some Steelers fans in there. Help me out. Come on, Rocky. Help me out. Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown. Okay. How, how about the Broncos? Some, I know there's some Broncos fans. There you go. Um, the Patriots. People know some of the Patriots just because they don't like them. Uh, Tom Brady, uh, the quarterback. Uh, and then the Falcons. I don't really know anybody on the Falcons. Anybody know? Pat Ryan. Okay. Um, most of the teams have athletes that stand out. Uh, there, there are the star players. They're the ones that you, uh, sometimes they'll even call them the playmakers, the ones that, that make things happen on the field. Um, but what you, what you understand and what you'll see tonight if you watch the Super Bowl is you'll, you'll start to understand that it takes more than just a good player uh, to win a game like the Super Bowl. In order for a football game to actually happen, it takes more uh, than just the, the, the highest paid athletes on the team. It takes everybody. Uh, Michael Jordan, I know he didn't play football. For those of you that know I'm not an athlete, don't crucify me, okay? Uh, I know he didn't play football. He played basketball, he played baseball, but he was awful at it. Um, but he said this. He said, talent wins games, but teamwork wins championships. The Super Bowl is about two teams playing each other. There are two squads that have worked hard both on and off the field because, and we've said this about the church too, it, it, what, it matters what happens off the field just as much what happens on the field and when it comes to preparation, especially for a game like the Super Bowl. We've all seen, uh, if you're uh, from Kansas City, you know that there's been things that have happened with our team where things happen off the field and it affects the team on the field. And... But I want to show you something because one of the things that the best teams know is the best teams know that it takes everyone to make things happen. It takes everyone to win a game, uh, win the game of football. But let me show you a picture. This is a picture of a Super Bowl ring. Specifically, it's the Patriots. Unfortunately, it's the Patriots, but here we go. Um, but the, the average Super Bowl ring costs somewhere around $7,000 to make, depending on the materials that, it, that they decide to put in it that year. And the winning team gets 100 and 50 rings to do something with, to give, to distribute whoever they want. They also have the option, should they want to, to buy more. Uh, but what you need to know is that there's only 53 men on the roster of the team. And of those 53, only 46 actually dress out for the game. And of those 46, not every one of them may make it on the field, depending on what happens 
in the game. And so there's a lot of discretion for the organization as to what they do uh, with those rings that they get. Because like I said, they have 150. And often those, thing, those rings will go to people like the coaching staff, um, the front office staff of the organization. Sometimes they'll go to like the equipment managers. It really depends on uh, where the organization decides to give those rings to. But what I want you to notice is if you look, I don't know if you can read it here. We're going to bring it just a little bit bigger. Uh, on the bottom right, there's this statement inside. It says, we are all patriots. Because great teams know that it takes everyone working together to make great things happen. It takes everybody. It takes uh, people in the front office. It takes people in the coaching staff. It takes people. It takes the equipment manager. Let's take, for instance, the, the, the Chiefs game, the, the, the game where uh, the Chiefs lost to the Steelers. The, that game was one we said that they didn't score a single touchdown. But that game was won by field goals. And so if, they, if the Steelers didn't have a kicker, how many of you know that would have been a problem? But let's, let's widen our scope just a little bit, because can you imagine Big Ben coming in to, to, to kick a field goal? Or how about one of the 300-pound linemen? That, that is not going to happen. And he's probably going to hurt something, and he's not going to be able to go back out on the field for the next play. But let's, uh, and that's okay. It's okay that they can't do that because that's not their position. It's not what they're gifted to do. But if we widen it for just a moment, think about just what had to happen in order for that field goal to make it. Who held the ball so he could kick it? Who hiked the ball so that the, kick, so that the holder could hold it so the kicker could kick it? Who even made sure that the ball had air in it? Not the Patriots. Um, but <laughs> who, who took care of the grass on the field so that the kicker didn't step in a divot and twist his ankle while he was trying to kick the ball? Who made sure that the kicker had cleats so that he could actually have the right footwear so that he could run on the field? You see, it takes a lot of people in order to set one man up to kick that field goal. And what's true about great teams is also true about the church. We are all Inglewood. We are. Our second value as a church is that we are better together. And that was not selected at random. If you look in the New Testament, Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, they both talk about how the, the, the church is the body of Christ. And it's made up of different members with different gifts and different abilities and different ways that they can contribute to the body. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16. It says, From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. I first heard that verse when I was in college, and it was actually quoted to me in the King James Version, and it said this, it said the body is, or New King James Version, it says the body is built up by that which every joint supplies. As every single person that is a part of the body contributes to what can happen within a church, the, the potential, the collective potential of the church begins to rise. It, but it takes everyone working together, and great teams know this, but the problem is that much of our world is focused on individuals. It's focused on my success. It's focused on my life. It's focused on uh, my time, what I do with my time. But thinking of only ourselves is not the way of Jesus. It's not the way that Jesus lived his life. It's not the way uh, that his apostles that followed him taught the church to live their life. Now, we're going to take kind of a left-hand turn this morning because we're actually going to talk about a man named Solomon. Um, and in the Old Testament, we find the character Solomon. He's the son of David. Uh, we, we may remember David from the last couple of weeks. We've been studying through some psalms that he wrote. Uh, David was the king of Israel. And uh, there's something that happened, David, because of his sin with Bathsheba that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it caused this turmoil to happen within Israel. And uh, so after David was king, there was kind of like this juggling, this fighting that happened amongst his sons and the generals to decide who was going to be the next king. But David knew that God was sovereign, and David knew that his son Solomon was going to be the next king. And what we find is in 1 Kings chapter 3, we find where, where Solomon is actually installed as the king of Israel. And God comes to Solomon, and he says, Solomon, I will give you one thing. I, you can ask me for anything, and I will give it to you. And what Solomon asked for is he said, I want wisdom. I want wisdom to be able to lead your people. I want wisdom to be able to guide this nation well. 
And what God did is he blessed Solomon's decision to ask for wisdom because he said, you asked for something that was not just for yourself. And so as a result of that, I'm going to bless the things that you do and I'm going to bless, uh, bless your family. And, and it happened and Solomon became very, very wealthy and he became very influential uh, throughout the ancient Near East. And, and he even began to make some alliances with other nations to expand his kingdom. The problem with that is this, those other nations didn't serve God. And so he began to grow his power through means that God never intended him to grow his power. And what began to happen is he began to reflect on his life. Solomon was a very wise man. We, we get the book of Proverbs from Solomon. If you've ever read the book of Proverbs, if you've never read the book of Proverbs, what you can do is on the first day of a month, just start reading. There's 31 chapters uh, in the book of Proverbs. And if you read one chapter a day, by the end of the month, you'll be through the book of Proverbs. And they're full of short, practical sayings about life and how life works. And, and sometimes Solomon just kind of says it. And I don't know if you've ever read that in the, in the book of Proverbs where he'll just say something. You go, whoa, you can't really, uh, you can't really ignore that. That's just kind of the way it is. But we also, what we know is that somewhere along the way, Solomon lost sight of that wisdom that God had given him. Somewhere along the way, he began to make decisions and surround himself uh, with relationships and, and, and different types of, of, of temptation through the, the, the alliances that he made. And even though he was very, very successful, he was very, very wealthy, one of the things he began to realize is that he didn't have a lot of close relationships around him. He didn't have a lot of people to what we as the church call do life with. And what he does is he begins to reflect at the end of his life. He begins to go, what is this all about? And that's where we get the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes, if you've ever read it, is kind of an interesting read. Um, Solomon, what he does is he works through the things that we tend to pursue when we say we're looking for true meaning in life. We tend to pursue things like success or riches or beauty. And what Solomon does is he systematically goes through all of those things and he just begins to say that they are vanity and they are meaningless because we pursue things that don't really matter. And one of the, thi one of the things they say about leadership, and this is probably something that Solomon was feeling, one of the things they say about leadership is that it's lonely at the top. And Solomon was beginning to experience some of this because he was realizing that he had this huge kingdom. He had so much influence, and yet he had no true companions in his life. He had servants, to be sure, because he was king. But those are not the types of relationships that bring true meaning. And so what we find in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, which is where we have our text this morning, Solomon begins to reflect on the value of relationships, the value that togetherness brings, the value on being part of a team. The title of today's message is, Are You On the Team? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Simply put, two people can get more done than one person can working alone. There's a, a synergy that happens when people work together. Now, uh, synergy, I looked up a definition for synergy this week, and it says this. The, the, by the way, the root words of synergy literally mean working together. But to help us understand it, synergy is the interaction of elements that when combined produce a total effect that is greater, that's important, that is greater than the sum of the individual elements, contributions, etc. Basically, what, I, what it's saying is that when synergy happens, the two no longer can only do what they can do on their own, but when the two combine their efforts, they can do more than they could have on their own even if they were working side by side. There's this unity, there's this synergy, there's the way that the elements begin to fix or, or interact with each other that strengthens the whole. Now imagine, Solomon used the example of two because two is the minimum number that you need for a relationship. You can't have a relationship with yourself. Um, you, there, there's two people to have a meaningful relationship, there needs to be two people. And, but imagine not just two people, but a team of people working together. I said earlier, we are all Inglewood. Imagine what could happen if every single person within the church said, I'm on the team. If every single person on the church said, I'm here to better this place. I'm here to enhance the ministries of what's happening. I'm here to enhance it, to further the mission of what God's doing through Inglewood. Because teams are more productive than individuals. Um, I, I asked for some help this morning. Um, let me see if he's here. I think he might have walked out. Um, 
but we, it'll still work. I'm going to ask Rocky to come up, and I'm going to ask Jacob to come up. Jacob's one of our KCSM students. Give Jacob some love. Now, you probably know what's getting ready to happen here. <laughs> He's ready. Um, here's, here's sometimes what we do. Is, it, it, this is sometimes how we try to approach life. We try to approach life, and even though what's, what's happening in our life is, is so much bigger than what we think we can handle, we, we try to go at it like Jacob's getting ready to go at it right now. Jacob, let's go. Oh, he's got some fight in him. Okay, all right. Now, here's what we do. Two are better than one because they get more return for the work. I need four people that will come up here right now and help Jacob. Dane, come on up. Joseph, Jake, Zach. We got the keyboard player up here. It's serious. Everybody's on this side. Right over here. <laughs> all right. Two are better than one because they get a good return for their work. Let's go. All right. Give them a hand. What I want you to see is in, it, with, with that is that if you take the five that were over here, more than likely, they're, because Rocky's pretty strong. I don't know. You don't want Rocky mad at you. Um, <laughs> More than likely, I, I, there's not a single one of them because they could probably beat Rocky on their own. But they put it together, and they can do more. There's power in numbers because we can be in great shape. We can be at the top of our game. But if we try to do it alone, there is still a limitation to what we can do. There's still a limitation to what we can do on our own. But sometimes there's this temptation for me, and there's a temptation for me as a leader, too, to say, I can just do it by myself. And sometimes, and this is going to sound awful, but, you know, in the sake of transparency, here it is. There are times that I do things on my own because I say to myself, I can get it done the way I want it done. And there's times that I do things on my own because I go, well, it's going to take me twice as long to explain it to this person when I can just do it and it be over. But here's the thing. When you have to, what you have to look at is you have to look at the contribution of your life. You have to look at what's actually happening. I can get the task done, or I can help somebody else learn how to do the task. Here's a couple of reasons that I have to fight this temptation as a leader. First, there are some things I simply can't do by myself. We saw it yesterday, Mega Day. If I just showed up, we packed about 400 boxes for the community of food yesterday, and if it would have been just me, I would have been here all day. I would have been here today and probably tomorrow. And maybe not much after that because they probably would have left. Uh, but second, I'm not helping those around me if I do everything by myself. And third, if I help others learn how to do what I do, then I can release them to do it and we can get more done together. Because there's a difference, and what you have to understand when we talk about team is there's a difference, there's a difference between a group of people and a team. Because a group of people, sometimes they, uh, they, maybe they have, uh, they all want the same things, but they have their own way of getting it. But on a team, everyone is committed to working together for the good of the whole team. Ecclesiastes 4.10 says this, If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Because there is a strength and a stability and a support in numbers. When we have people around us, when we're part of a team, there is someone there that can help us. There's somebody there that can pick you up. There's somebody there that can be there when you fall. Something else that it does is it allows you, uh, it, it, there can be days that we have bad days that we stumble, and yet we're still okay. There can be days where, or, or, uh, they say this about crisis. I think it was Andy Stanley that, that I originally heard this. He said, he said, if you're not in a crisis or you're not coming out of a crisis, get yourself ready because you're probably getting ready to head into a crisis. And that's why we need every single person within the body of Christ. That's why we say around here that we are better together because we understand that every single person at some point will need somebody else. And if we don't understand that, what can happen is we can end up out there on our own. And there's times that what we need is that we go through seasons and, and we, things happen in our lives. And what we need is we need people around us that are going to help us, keep us strong. Think about the illustration of the football team this morning. 
There will be people on that field that are injured that can't necessarily uh, perform at their fullest capacity, but their teammates can make up for it. They may miss a tackle, but the next thing you know, there's somebody else coming along and is going to catch it. Why? Because we can do more together than we can apart. When we are committed to a team, we're committed to the welfare of everyone on the team. Now, this is a challenging thing sometimes because what, what, when in a room this size, I know that there's all different lives. I know there's all different experiences. We're all going through different seasons. And the challenge in a room this size is that not everybody can have a relationship with everyone. But everybody can have a relationship with someone. And what I would challenge you to do is if you don't have somebody in this room that you feel like you're connected to, you feel like you have a relationship with, I would encourage you to reach out. It's one of the reasons that we encourage people to be connected into groups, to be in our small groups, our community, as we sometimes call it. Because what we have to be is we have to be connected to other people. Because what, happen, what tends to happen in a church, especially a church this size, is, is we wait too long in the process before we ask for help. We wait too long in the process before we let people know what's going on. I remember having conversations with Pastor Doug because I know uh, in, in, in this area there's, there's a lot of difficulty with um, uh, paying bills and, and making sure that the lights stay on and making sure that, that, that people can stay in their houses and things like that. And one of the challenges is sometimes what can happen, especially with leadership, is, is people will come and they'll say, hey, I need help. But in that moment, what it is for them, it's an emergency. And the challenge is recognizing that there was a process that got you there. And if we had people around us, if we all had a community that we could invite people into our process and support us and, and, and be there for us, then maybe we could stop some of the things from happening. Some of it is just being able to pray. Praying for wisdom in decisions. Praying for wisdom in how we handle our family, how we handle just our perspective. I know in our own, in my own experience, with the anxiety and things that we've been walking through as a family, one of the things that I know is I know that we have a community of people around us that love us. I know that we, have, we were in our small group Friday night and we just had the opportunity to share with them about how meaningful it was for us to be in community. And, and, and it was just an opportunity for them to turn around and just uh, love and encourage uh, myself and Ashley and just say, we're with you in this. We're going to get through this. And it's an amazing thing. And what I, that's why we encourage community here at Inglewood. But the, what you have to understand about connection to a team is that connection to a team is best established early. Because like I said, sometimes we wait too long to process. Think about the Super Bowl tonight. How many have seen those NFLshop.com commercials if you watch football? What would happen if I would uh, go and order a, a Falcons jersey? Because not the Patriots. We don't like the Patriots. Um, what if I would what if I would show up and I, I would order a Falcons jersey, the whole outfit from NFLshop.com, and I would show up and I was like, all right, coach, put me in. Put me in. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to play. I've watched all the games. I haven't, but he doesn't know that. I, 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 I watch all the games this season, and I'm ready to play. It's too late. Why? Because I'm not on the team. I didn't do anything to help them get there. And sometimes what can happen is in our relationships, we can, we, what we'll do is we'll wait and we'll just kind of try to do things on our own and we'll try to do things on our own and we'll try to do things on our own. And then the situation gets to where we simply can't handle it on our own anymore and then we want to reach out. And sometimes we can and sometimes there will be those people around us that, are, that, that will do anything for anybody and they will reach out, they'll grab your hand and they'll pull you back. But what if we could prevent some of those things from happening because of relationship, because we're a part of a team, because we're invested in what's happening here and we're invested in what's happening in each other's lives. Because when you're a part of the team, people know you and they can journey with you. You have people around you that support you. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 says, Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. Verse 11 is specifically talk, talking about uh, keeping warm is to conserve body heat because in the Middle East, it gets pretty cold in the desert at night. You wouldn't think so because in the desert it's hot during the day, but at night it can get pretty cold. And so 
especially the poor, they have to stay near each other uh, so, that they, that, so that they can conserve body heat. But think about it in terms of how, how when we're working together that we can begin to feed off of one another. Have you ever gotten more excited about something because somebody around you was excited? One of the things they say is they say that laughter is contagious. Sneezing is contagious too. I've never figured that one out. Uh, but, it, but have you ever gotten more excited? Have you ever been more passionate? If you ever, uh, I may cheer for a game, a sports game, if I'm sitting there with a group of people, but by myself, I was like, oh, that's good. <laughs> when I was watching the World Series, when the Royals were in the World Series, like I was by myself, um, and the, the game got over, and I was like, oh. <laughs> Ain't nobody here, everybody's asleep. Um, so, but, it's a, but if I was in a group of people, we would have been able to celebrate. We would have been able to feed off of the energy. The same thing happens. Why do we have people pray with people in church? Because there is this faith that begins to build up within us when we work together. When we partner our faith with each other and we begin to say, we're going to do this together. But it's a part of being a team. It's a part of being part of a team. Somebody that's never been a part of a team, you don't really get that. You don't really understand it. You can kind of look and go, well, well, I kind of do my own thing. But you don't understand the camaraderie, the community that can happen. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. There's this growth that happens when we do life together. We can encourage each other. We can challenge each other. We can inspire each other. We can pray for each other. You look throughout the Old Testament and you, all, you find all kinds of what they call the one another's, which are those things that we can only do in relationship with other people. Verse 12 of, of Ecclesiastes 4, uh, basically what it's talking about is it says that teams watch out for each other and they help each other. And this is just in the purely physical sense of things. But think about for a moment that the, but the New Testament says that the Spirit of God comes to live inside of those who believe. And so if, we have, if this is the purely physical, the Old Testament, they didn't have the, uh, the, the spirit working in the same operation that we have today. And what I would challenge you is this. If Jesus said that two or three, if two or three agree as touching anything, it shall be done for them, how much more powerful is it for us as Christians uh, that the world can look at this thing of teamwork and they say we can get more done together, but how much more powerful when our efforts and our faith are infused with the power of the Holy Spirit? How much more can we get done? Because we don't, just serve, we don't just serve on teams that say, well, I can do this and you can do that and I can do this. No, we serve on a team that says, God has given me gifts and abilities and he's enabled me to do them. But not only that, but he gives me more grace when I need it. And he gives me, he, he supercharges my efforts so that they have more return. That's an amazing thing. but are you on the team? Those churches that you see around the world, you look at them and you go, how can they do that? There is a force of people that have said, this is my church. This is my community. These are my people. And we are going to work together. We are going to do this mission. We are going to. Because God has called us here. Now, at the end of these verses, there's kind of a cryptic statement. And, and for a while, I just kind of was like, I have no idea what this means. It even kind of strange, even still. Uh, but basically, it says this. It says, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. If you can't see it from where you're sitting, there's three different colors here. There's pink, yellow, and blue, light blue. You can tell I got it from the girls, right? Uh, but what it is is it's three separate strands of yarn. And what this, what this verse says in, in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, it says that um, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. Now, what I did um, for the sake of illustration this morning is I have, I have a bucket. It's just an empty bucket, okay? Um, and I, I tied one of the strands of this rope together. And so if I pick this up, bucket up, it holds the bucket, right? Or maybe not. But if you take the same yarn, but you get it in a cord of three strands, it holds the bucket. Not only does it hold the bucket, but it can take a little bit of abuse. We can do more together than we can apart. Let's up the ante a little bit. 
We have a big job. Independence is a tough city. We need each other, right? There's a lot of baggage. There's a lot of weight. And if I were to try, say I take this, and I try to say, well, we've got three people. We separate. We've got three people that want to reach this city. But we all have different ideas of how it's going to happen. And we say, we're going to do it. Three people. But there's power in unity. There's power when a group of people come together. And they come together and they say, we're going to do this. We're going to reach this city. When we have a common mission, when we're working together, we want to do the same things. We want to see God do the same things in our city. There's a power that happens. Scholars think that when, when, when Solomon wrote a cord of three strands, they're not easily broken. He started with the two that are involved in relationship. And what he's saying is he's saying that third strand comes in and that third strand is God himself. It's the spirit of God that infuses his people. But imagine if we didn't just have two people or three people or four people, but we had the entire church say, this is my church and this is our community that we're going to reach. But the question for you this morning is this, are you on the team. Because there are a lot of people that are involved. But what they say about football is this. Football is 40,000 people badly in need of exercise, watching 22 people badly in need of rest. <laughs> and the honest truth about it is, is that sometimes that's the same way we are here. And I want to challenge you for just a moment. Here's where I'm going to push back for just a moment. Because being a spectator can be good at times. But at some point to truly make a difference, you have to move from being a spectator to being part of the team. There's not a single spectator that's going to get a Super Bowl ring tonight. Just a couple of observations about spectators. Spectators watch. Team members participate. Spectators have their own lives. Team members' lives are connected to the success of the team. Spectators invest little. Team members invest everything. One of the important things about building a team is you have to have enough players on the field. I, I, many of you know I went to school here, and one of the things that I did when I went to school here is I played soccer. But we often played what we called Iron Man soccer. Uh, because, we, because we were a smaller school, typically we had enough players to have enough people on the field. But if you know anything about soccer, you, you need some substitutes. You need some people that can give you some rest. And often what would happen is we would start off a game really, really well, but then we would begin to get tired because we didn't have enough people to help us out. And, and I remember playing one team in particular, the Platte County Pirates. Uh, we hated playing the Platte County Pirates because we were doing good to like make it through the full 90 minutes of the soccer game. And the Platte County Pirates, they would walk out on the field and they had what looked like three field, three, three teams ready to play. And it was even like about every time the ball would go out of bounds, they would, they would sub somebody in and they were always fresh and they were always ready to go. Why? Because they had more people involved in the team. They had more people contributing to winning the football game. Now, we have a wonderful group of volunteers here at Inglewood. We do. Just like we said earlier, that when we were talking about the kicker for the Steelers, it takes a lot of people to position that kicker to kick the field goal. It takes a lot of people to get it to where uh, whoever's speaking gets up here on Sunday and, and can deliver a message. There is more going into this than just the preparation for this message. Some of you may not realize it, but it takes somewhere between 30 and 40 volunteers to make Sunday morning happen. And I want to take just a few moments to celebrate some of the volunteers that we have. Because we've been going through a season of transition as a church, and we've had some staff change, some, some, some leadership change here at the church. And we've had people, some of you, that have stepped up to say, I'm going to be a part of what God's doing here. In the, children, the children's church worker, workers, Ashley Watkins and her volunteers that, that, that watch your kids every single week so that you can be in here and enjoy the service and be a part of what's going on. Uh, Lacey McLean and Susan King that, that, have, that help with our nursery program to make sure that the little ones, my son Oliver's in there. Could you imagine me trying to preach this message with Oliver? You probably would laugh more, but <laughs> it wouldn't happen. Why? 
because it takes more than just one person. Zach Nickel, who's been doing a fantastic job leading the worship team, he just stepped in and he said, he, 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 he said let's do this. Eric, Benita, Dylan, Angela, JC, Nick, all of those that have been a part of this worship team, making the worship experience what it is here. And then there's some that you may not even realize. The Welcome Home Team, a group of people that get here an hour before service starts so that they can be ready when you guys get here. The coffee shop volunteers, our media team. Did you know that some of our media and our lights people get here two hours before service starts so they could be ready for you? And let's not forget those outside of our Sunday morning. We have our uh, impact leaders, our ranger leaders, our marketplace volunteers, our youth workers, our small group leaders. We really are better together. We get more done when we work as a team. Let's hear it for just a moment for all of our volunteers. Can you give them a hand? Because God is doing something. God is doing something. If you're a volunteer, this is for you. That you give time every single week out of your life so that you can contribute to what God's doing here. God is doing some awesome things here at Inglewood. And so the question that I've been asking throughout this morning is this, are you on the team? Because we have teams that meet all over this place, uh, all throughout the week, uh, doing different tasks, getting different things ready for Sunday morning, getting different things ready for Wednesday night. And what I wanna challenge you with this morning is if we can do what we currently do with the team that we have, what could we do if we combine the efforts of every single person that calls Inglewood their church? What if every single person made that step this morning and went from being a spectator to being, put me in coach, I'm ready to play. Now, in case you just, just in case you misunderstood me for uh, just a moment this morning, I'm not just talking about what happens on Sunday. Because the church, the body of Christ is so much more than a Sunday morning service. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 said this. This is some of the last words that Jesus said to his disciples before he left. He said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. How many know that's going to take more than one person? Jesus started with 12 on the day of Pentecost. It multiplied and then the church began to multiply and spread throughout the world. But it, God continues to work through his church today. God continues to work through people that have a relationship with him today. And perhaps this morning, we need to stop thinking about Sunday morning service as the playing field. And we need to start thinking of the Sunday morning service as the locker room. Because what happens in the locker room? That's where you talk strategy. That's where you get a game plan for what's gonna happen when you go out on the field. That's where you tend to wounds and you, you assess injuries to make sure that the team is healthy. And if not, you've got the doctors that come in and they bring health back to the team so the team can be sent back to the field ready to play. In the locker room is where you get words of encouragement and inspiration. And you take those feelings that we talked about. You take that, that, that collective uh, as you get more excited about something because you're a part of a team. You walk out of this building and you're not just excited about what's happening here, but you begin to get excited about what God's going to do out there because you understand that we're part of a team. Because every single one of you, uh, you have your own lives, you have your own jobs, you have your own neighborhoods, your own families, and you will walk out of this place and you will, you will come in contact with people this week that many of us will never see unless you reach them. You have influence in people's lives that I don't have influence in. You have an ability to encourage people that I don't have the ability to encourage. But it takes us all. Are you part of the team? Do you want to be part of the team? 
because I firmly believe that the best days for Inglewood are ahead of us. Are you on the team? Let's pray. Father God, this morning, I thank you for what you're doing here. I thank you for the way that your spirit's been moving in our services. God, I thank you for the way that you're bringing unity to our church. God, the way that you're giving us direction. And God, I pray right now for every single person in this room, every single person that calls Inglewood Church their church. God, you've called us to more than just waiting for you to come back. You've called us to be a part of what you're doing here. God, and if you've called us to this church, you've called us to be a part of what you're doing in this church, through this church. Now, there's some of you in the room this morning that may, may say, you know, Pastor Andy, I, I just kind of found my way in here. Maybe somebody invited you. Maybe you've been hanging out for a little while, but you've never really made a decision to follow Christ. And so you say, you know, Pastor Andy, I can't even be a part of the team because I haven't even been initiated into the team. What I want to tell you this morning is that the Bible says that, that if you confess your sins, uh, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so this morning, what, 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 what you need to know if you say, you know what, Pastor Andy, I don't have a relationship with God this morning. You can start one today. You can be what we call initiated into the team today to say, God, I want to follow you. I want to be a part of what you're doing in my city. I want to be a part of what you want to do in my life. And I want to be a part of what you want to do in my family. If that's you this morning and you say, I don't have a relationship with God, but I want to start one today. Or maybe you need to rededicate this morning. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you. I want to see who you are. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. What I want to do is I just want to lead you in a prayer. And I want to ask the entire church to pray with us. We're better together. We give courage to each other together. We inspire the faith of each other together. Let's pray. If you raise your hand and you said, I want to start a relationship with God today, I encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, thank you for sending your son to pay the price for my sin. God, forgive me, cleanse me, and make me clean. Help me to follow you. Show me how to, you want me to be a part of what you're doing. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Give God a hand clap this morning. This is a big deal. It's a big deal. If you would, stand with me. Stand with me. The way we're going to end this service is I just want to pray over you because we are, uh, like I said earlier, we are all Inglewood. If you feel like Inglewood is your church home, if you feel like this is where God has called you to, then we are all Inglewood. And what I want to challenge you with this morning is this. Are you on the team? Maybe you, I even told the welcome home team this this morning. I said, the thing, sometimes it's not just are you on the team, but are you on the right spot on the team? Because we all have different gifts. We all have different abilities. We all have different talents. We all have different life stories. We can reach people that other people can't reach. And that's good and that's great. But if we refuse to get off of the bench and into the field, then we never join the team. So as just as a closing prayer, if you would, you just say, God, I want to be a part of what you're doing here at Inglewood. If you would just raise your hands just as a sign of surrender, I'm going to pray over you and then you'll be dismissed. Father God, I thank you for our church. I thank you for these people. God, I thank you for your love and your grace, God, that you've extended to every single one of them. God, and those that have said that they want to be a part of what you're doing here, God, that, that, that they want to be used by you, God, I pray that you would strengthen them. God, that you would give them faith. God, that you would put hope inside of them, that you would begin to give them dreams. Lord God, that you would use them, God, even as they walk out of this place. God, they go to different lives, different families. They have contact with people that we don't have. God, I pray that you would use them. God, give them boldness to tell about what you've done in their lives. God, give them words of encouragement for people. God, give them words that they can use, God, to pray for other people. God, use them to invite people back here. God, not 
not just so that they come here, but God, so that they meet you. Lord God, and I pray that you would take the combined efforts of every single person in this church and that you would use them to change the city of independence. God, may there be a day that the city of independence says, we're glad that Inglewood is here. Do it in your name. Amen. Amen. Have a great Sunday.